Well, hey, everybody, man, I want to welcome you here this weekend. We're so glad that you're with us, no matter where you're at TV, watching online, wherever you are at one of our in-person locations, maybe in Bluefield or Marion, over in Bristol or here in Abingdon, out in country, chapel, wherever you are today. I believe that God has brought you here or allowed you to watch from your location for this message. Now, we've been talking about purpose and why God has created us. And a lot of times uh, I share a message that honestly, there are times I don't feel qualified to share that message. I mean, it's a truth out of scripture that I'm just like, I'm, I'm not sure I can really convey that and teach it in a way that people can understand. But today I, I feel like this is a message that at least I have a lot of time invested that I can share with you. I don't know that I'm qualified to teach it, but I feel like I can at least share with you some of the mistakes I've made in my own life and sort of my journey as I followed Christ over these past 45 years and that Jesus somehow would connect us together today and help us to understand of who he wants us to be. So a little review, in case you missed uh, the last couple of weeks, we sort of kicked off this series. We didn't title it on Baptism Sunday, but uh, we kicked it off last week as the path of purpose. And uh, on Baptism Sunday, I, I sort of shared the first purpose that God created us for. It's not to do something for God or even to, you know, be somebody that he desires for us to be. But the first purpose primary purpose that you were created is just to receive something from God, to receive the love that God has for you. And that's sort of the bedrock of our life. And if you don't get this, if you don't understand that all God wants you to do first and foremost in he, in his creation of you is to receive the love he has for you. And, and I've said many times that if you truly understood how much God loved you, you, you would serve him. You would love him because it's incredible what, how much the Lord loves us. So that's the first purpose. And then last week we talked about that second purpose that God also has created us to belong to his family. And the church is his family. And many of you went online and you went to our website and you clicked that little next step tab and you went down and, and you looked at how to join and become a part of our church family. And man, that's awesome. I'm so glad you did. And for those of you who still need to do that, I want to encourage you to do it. Now today, and these are really building blocks. So the first one, I'm loved by God. Second, he wants me to belong to his family that he's created so I can find support and I can have people to help me along this journey in life. And then the third purpose I want to look at today, not, not just God wants to love me and not just he wants me to belong to his family, but here's the third thing that he wants. The third purpose in your life is you're called to become like God. You're called to become like Jesus. Now, when I share that, it, it's often intimidating because you think, well, I'm imperfect and Jesus was perfect. And so there's no way I'm ever going to fulfill it. And you're right. There's no way we're ever going to become a God. That's not what he's asking us to be. But he wants us to become more and more as we serve Jesus. God wants us to be more and more like his son. And uh, we find this taught in Scripture in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. These are very famous passages. It says this. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. That's all of us who are believers in Jesus. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them, and here's the purpose, to become like his son. It's the third purpose of your life. Once you get into God's family, God wants you to grow up and he wants you to become like Jesus Christ. So my third calling in life is to become like Christ, to become like Jesus. So let's talk about that. What does that mean? Well, um, again, you're not ever going to be like Jesus completely. You're not going to be a God. And Jesus, we know, is God. God is God. We're not. We have to understand that. But uh, it's an antidote to stress when we realize that, that he's the God of the universe and we're part of his plan. God wants you to become godly. He wants you to begin to uh, inherit and practice the attributes and the life that Jesus lived before us. In other words, he wants you to take on the characteristics of his son. And uh, he puts us in his family to learn that. So uh, we've had that old saying, like father, like son. The Bible says that God is loving, that God is joyful, God's peaceful, God is patient with us, God is kind. 
God is self-controlled. He is merciful. It's the fruit of the Spirit we're taught, Peter teaches us about. These are all pictures of the characteristics of the life of Jesus. And if you're going to come like Jesus, it means that we're to be filled with love. We're to be filled with joy. That God wants us to be filled with peace in our lives, to have patience in our lives, self-control, all these quantities and qualities that Jesus had. He wants us to have in our life. Now, in the Bible, it compares becoming like Jesus to running a race. And again, I've been running this race called the Christian life for years and years and years. I got saved when I was almost 17 years old, and I'm 61. You can do the math. I mean, it's been a long, long time. I've been in ministry 40 full-time years this year. So it is a, a race of life. That's how the Christian life is compared in Scripture. It's not a 50-yard dash, you know, that we're running. Uh, it's a marathon, and I'm not a marathon runner by any means, but it's likened to that in the Christian journey as we grow day by day in our life. And all of us are running the race, the marathon to maturity that God desires for us in our life. And our goal is to become the man of God that God created me to be or the woman of God that God created you to be. Uh, that's the goal that God has for us. Now, many of you know I just got back from Kenya, and where we were at in Kenya was the place, it's called the City of Champions for Runners. And every morning when we would get up at daybreak, there would be runners from all over the world that were Olympian runners, and they come to this little city of Eldoret, Kenya, and that's where they do all their training for the Olympics all around the world. And so all the Olympic teams have come, and they're training there, and all the coaches are there. The guy lives there that ran the marathon in an hour and 59 minutes that broke the two-hour. And the reason they train there is because uh, it's 8,000, uh, the altitude is 8,000 feet. So I could hardly walk, much less run without gasping for breath. But if you can learn to run in that culture, then you can be a champion anywhere in the world. So the neat thing about when we liken our Christian journey to a race is God doesn't want us to stay the same. He doesn't want you to be in spiritual diapers your entire life. He wants us to grow up just like we want our kids to grow up. So as we look at Jesus, you know that God wants you to become like him. So how do we do this? I mean, this is the real question, isn't it? How do we uh, run our race and become more and more on this marathon to maturity to be like Jesus? Well, I want to give you some steps today. And these are just steps that I've learned. They're pretty simple, nothing earth shattering, but I think they can really help you. They've helped me. Here's the first one. If I'm going to run the race of life that God has for me, I have to simplify my life. I just have to simplify my life. I got to simplify the things in my life. I got to cut out, clean out, discard all the junk that's holding me back from becoming the person that God wants me to become. And if, if you're going to be who God wants you to be, you got to clean out some clutter. I mean, you got to clean up your mind. Uh, you probably will have to lessen your schedule. You got to clean up your relationships, get rid of the, all that unnecessary baggage in your life. In other words, when you look at these marathon runners and these guys over in Kenya, they're not running in a parka, all right? I mean, they're, they're running in, uh, in, in, you know, a little flimsy pair of shorts and a T-shirt that you can sort of see through. I mean, they don't have nine layers of clothes on them when they're running a marathon. They don't want anything weighing them down. They are running in the lightest clothes and the lightest shoes they can find. So in order to run the race to maturity in the Christian journey, you don't want a bunch of extra baggage that you're trying to carry through life. So really, if you're going to become the man or the woman that God wants you to be, the first thing you got to do is probably just get rid of some stuff. <laughs> I mean, you're to eliminate the diversions, the distractions, the detours, the dead ends, the time wasters. There's probably some people and some friendships in your life that Maybe you need to evaluate and think, do I want to continue in these relationships? And how do you know? Well, are they drawing you closer to God? Or are they the ones that are pulling you farther away from God? Now, the place where we see this in Scripture is Hebrews chapter 12. It's one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. And in Hebrews chapter 12, we see this metaphor of life as a race. And I want us to look at this. In verse 1, this is what it says. It says, let us strip off anything that slows us down 
or holds us back, especially those sins that wrap themselves so tightly around our feet, trip us up, and let us run with patience the particular race that God has set before us. So what the scripture teaches is that God has a particular race for your life, and you're the only one that can run your race. Now, this is important because your mom can't run your race for you, and your boyfriend, your girlfriend can't run your race for you. Somebody else can't run your race. And by the way, you can't run anybody else's race either. You have a particular race that God wants you to run in life. And the, you know, the problem is everybody else has a race that God wants them to run. And they often want you to run along with them in their race. So uh, everybody's got their own race to run. And you have your race to run. And you have to decide... Am I going to run my race? Am I going to run, you know, the race that God has called me to? Or am I going to get caught up in running somebody else's race or somebody else's plan for my life that they desire for me? I mean, you can't run them both, right? You have to decide. So I want to challenge you. The particular race that God has designed for you is the one you want to run. That's the one you want to run. And just say, God, uh, here I am. I want to get closer to you and become more like Jesus. So Lord, help me strip off everything. Help me get the junk out of my life. Lord, bring up those things that are holding me back, the habits that are hurting me, the hurts and the hang-ups that I've struggled with that are holding me back from being like you, God. I want to let go of those things so I can run the particular race that you have created me to run, which means you're going to have to let go of some things in your life, and you're going to have to let go of some expectations in your life because you just can't please everybody. I mean, you just can't. You're not going to be able to please everybody and please God. I would say please God, and then, you know, everybody else is just going to have to, they're going to have to be okay with that because you can only run your race. Now, you got to decide, did God put me on this earth to you know, please all these other people to please my parents. And, you know, I want you to please your parents. Do you, do you want to run your race to please your girlfriend? Well, you know, that's a temptation. Please your teachers, your little clique, your buddies. You know, is, is that who you're running your race to please? Or are you going to say, God, I really need to let go of some stuff here. I need to evaluate my life, simplify it, get rid of some things that are keeping me from being all that you want me to be. And then... Focus in on that one race that God has created you to run and run it with all your heart. And man, when you begin to do that, life just gets so much more peaceful and you realize you're running your race for an audience of one, it is freeing in your life. So number one, the marathon to maturity, simplify your life. Here's number two, don't get impatient and don't get in a hurry. I would say this uh, race that we're running uh, you don't ever fully complete. Uh, I know in a marathon, it's 26 miles or something, and you can cross the finish line. We cross the finish line when we get to heaven, and we run this race of our maturity our entire life here on earth. So don't get impatient. You're not going to finish it in a week or a month or even years. God's plan is to make you the person he wants you to be, and it's a lifetime plan. It's going to take you your entire life, and you just can't run that race quickly. I mean, it's not some 50-yard dash. It's a marathon, so don't get impatient. I remember back in high school, and uh, I, I think I've shared this before, but I'm not a runner. I never have been. But they, they had this thing uh, with your physical fitness test. You had to run the 600-yard dash. Well, I wasn't always a chunky guy, and uh, I could run pretty quick, actually. And uh, so I remember when we'd go out there, and there was this big track, and you had to run, I think it was four laps around the track for your 600-yard dash, whatever it was. And, and uh, I can remember the first time, that, you know, Coach blew the whistle, and, and he was a guy I really liked. He sort of invested in me. I wanted to make him proud. And I remember when he tells me about 600 dash, he said, go with everything you got. And he blew the whistle, dude, and I went with everything. I, I mean, I ran, and I'll tell you what, I'm ahead of everybody in my class. I and mean, we had about 30 kids, and some of them were athletes. I outpaced them all for about the first half the lap. And then as I go around that first lap, everybody begins to pass me. Second lap, I sort of stop and walk a little bit. Third lap, I'm gasping for breath, and the girls start passing me by. I was second to last 
finishing the 600-yard dash. I didn't impress him at all. So, you know, I would say you got to pace yourself, okay? You just don't go out there with everything you got first day. You got to pace yourself. You're going to run out of steam. You don't, you know, if you don't do that, you're going to give up and you're never going to finish. So when you become a Christian, you remember those days? I remember when I was almost 17, I got saved at a Christian camp and I was just so excited. I, mean, I was on fire for the Lord. <laughs> I didn't know much about him, but man, I had a passion. He had redeemed me and saved me, and, and I was excited. I was forgiven, and, and I, I just remember growing so quick in those early days. I mean, I had a heart like never before to read the Bible. I wanted all my family and all my friends to know Jesus. I was witnessing to everybody. I was so bold. And, you know, I did that for probably a good year. And then, you know, a lot of my friends got saved and I had the opportunity to see them come to know Jesus. But then I began to think this is a pace I can't sustain. I mean, it's, it's too much. I mean, I was just all the time preaching on the school campus. I mean, it was crazy. And I grew really, really fast in those early days. But then I realized if I'm going to sustain and not burn out, I got to pace myself. Because honestly, God wants strong, stable, secure believers. And when the rough winds of life come against us, he wants us to be able to stand like a solid oak tree. You know, and it takes a long time. We got big oak trees in our yard. <clears throat> and uh, I've had some guys over to look at them. They say they're well over a couple of hundred years old. So that's the way that God wants us to run the race. We got to pace ourselves. We can't get impatient. Maturity takes time. It just takes time. Here's the third thing. We got to spend some time focusing on Jesus every day, every day. You know, I somehow have to build into my schedule, and my schedule's like yours, often busy, but I got to spend a little bit of time. Now, I'm not talking about two hours, you know. I mean, if you can, that's awesome. I hope in my next season of life, man, I can just spend a couple hours every morning with Jesus. But right now, the schedule that I keep, I'm trying to spend a few minutes, sometimes five, sometimes 10. Sometimes I'll spend 15. But I want to focus on Jesus at a certain point in my life every day. And and that's really what this next verse talks about in this race for life. Why do I need to spend some time focusing my thoughts and my mind on Jesus every day? Because whatever you want to become, you need to think about. If I want to become like Jesus, I got to think about him. Because you become whoever you spend the most time with. I mean, that's how our mind works. And if you hang out with people who have no ambition, you're not going to have any ambition. You hang out with people who are critical, all of a sudden you become critical. You hang out with people that are, you know, all the time fussing and cussing and doing all, well, all that's, that's who you become. You know, I, I shared a message years ago about show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Yeah, that's so true. So if you spend time with Jesus every day, then... You know, that time you'll become more and more and more like him. Now, we call this a quiet time. For those of you that are new to faith, I would say one of the most important things you can do in your life is just establish a quiet time. I think the best time's in the morning, but I'm sort of a morning person. But just get up, go find yourself your favorite chair or whatever, and sit down and spend some time with Jesus. You know, I, I sort of read the Bible for five or ten minutes, and then I... I talk to God, just you know, like I'm talking to you. And I tell the Lord a bunch of stuff I got on my heart. And, and then I, I take a little time and listen to see what he wants to say to me. And some days I'm stressed and I try to give God that stress. And I say, Lord, I need your help today. And, and then I just, I sort of sit there and I just, I just let God give me his peace and remind me that he's got my future in his hands. He's going to take care of me. But I just think spend some time focusing on Jesus Every day. This is what the verse says in verse 2, Hebrews 12. He says, we do this. In other words, we we run in our race of life by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Uh, So he tells us to do this, focusing on him every day, on whom our faith depends from start to finish. I just say you can't become like Jesus unless you spend some time with him. Here's the fourth thing. When it gets hard, remember the reward. Because life's going to get hard from time to time. When life gets hard, You have to remember, as a child of God, the reward that we have. You know, the goal of God, the goal for God to make you the man or the woman he wants you to be is this lifetime process. Again, it's not some quick little 50-yard dash. So you're going to go through in this 
life that God gives you to live, a lot of problems. I mean, you're going to encounter pressures and trials and difficulties. You're going to have ups and downs in your life. And God's going to use all those things, the good times and the bad times, to make you more like him. So God's number one goal is to make you like Jesus Christ. That's what he says he wants us to become. He wants you to be loved. He wants you to belong. He wants you to become like his son, Jesus. And that means, and I want you to listen real close here, that if God's going to make you like Jesus, then he's going to allow you to go through things that he allowed his son to go through. I mean, were there times that Jesus was lonely? Yes, there was. Were there times that Jesus got criticized? Yes. Were there times that he was betrayed? Absolutely. Were there times when Jesus was worn out, even though he was God, that he was fatigued, he was tired, and he had to escape after he'd been teaching all these times? He was human, but he was God. He had to go to the mountain and, and be restored. There were times he was wore out. Were there times Jesus was misunderstood? Yes. So if God didn't spare his own son from those things, why do you think he's going to spare you? He's not. And the next time you start to ask, now, Lord, here I've been trying to serve you. I've been going to church. I've been giving a little and all these kind of things. And why is this happening to me? Why well, you need to realize that he's going to use that to build you in your maturity. He's building your character. He's changing your attitude. He's helping you become more and more like Christ. So instead of asking why, just, you know, I, I always say, well, what? You know, what do you want me to learn from this situation? Obviously, I'm in it. It's out of my control. So, God, there's a lesson here you want me to learn. And what is it? I mean, we shouldn't be surprised when problems come into our life. Problems are part of the process on our marathon to maturity. Uh, notice here in verse 2 and 3, Hebrews 12 says this. said, Jesus did not give up when he was running his race because of the cross. On the contrary, now was the cross a problem? Yeah, I mean, it was pain. He died. On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him in heaven, the reward. He thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross. He knew the reward on the other side. And he is now seated at the right side of God's throne. So think of what he went through. How he put up with so much, so much hatred from sinners. Don't let yourselves become discouraged and give up. Man, isn't that great words from the author of Hebrews? It's part of the plan. Problems are part of the plan. And here's a great promise. I love, I love uh, reading Peter. You know, he struggled so much in his Christian life and often say things that, you know, he didn't think about. I mean, I, I feel like I can relate to that dude. In chapter 5 of 1 Peter, he says this, After you suffer for a while... For a short time, God, who gives all grace, will make everything right. Isn't that neat? He will make you strong. He will support you. He will keep you from falling. He calls you to share in his glory in Christ, a glory that will continue forever. So we're going to have some short-term problems here on earth for some long-term glory in heaven. Well, here's the fifth thing. I think um, these guys that are champions, one of the things when I learned in Kenya is that if you're going to be a champion Olympic runner, you have to gather a team of other runners to run with you. Now, you may disagree with that. Those of you who are runners, I don't know. Again, I'm not a runner. But David, uh, Pastor David said, if you're going to be an Olympic champion, you're not going to get there on your own. He said, every coach here in Eldoret gets a team to run with their fastest runners. And I think that's true in the Christian life. You have to gather a team to run with you. I want a team to run with me. It's your race. Nobody can run your race, but people can support us in the race we're running. And in your life at different stages of the race, you're going to need different people to run along with you. You know, nobody's going to run your entire race with you because... If you're married, you know, there were several years you weren't married. You know, that spouse wasn't running that race with you. At different stages of your life, you have different people running the race with you, helping you, encouraging you, and supporting you. Now, in the church, we call that a small group. And if you're not involved in a small group, well, again, I would say you need some runners to run with you. You need a small group. And it's important. They'll help you when the troubles come and the problems come. They will sustain you and strengthen you and be with you. 
Because if you're out there running on your own, you're probably going to give up. And you're going to get discouraged. And you're not going to become the man or the woman that God wants you to be. But you need some other folks in your life to run with you. Uh, this last time I was in Kenya, I think that was my 12th or 13th time to Africa. And uh, God used Africa just to change my life. Uh, one of my trips to Tanzania, I remember this proverb. I wrote it down. It's, it's not a scripture, but it, it's a proverb that uh, somebody in Africa left. And I thought, man, it's so true. And this is what it says. To run fast, run by yourself. But to run far, run with people. I never forgot that. So, you know, we don't need 100 people to run with us every day, you know, probably don't need 20. But I, I promise you, you're going to need four or five folks in your life to run with you. And we just, we just need some folks who we can be accountable to and share our hardships with. And you're running with them. They're running with you. You're supporting each other. And when you feel like giving up, they're going to keep you going. Well, that's important. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 says this, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Spur just means to encourage. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another as you see the day approaching. So you need people to run with. And that's the reason I encourage you to belong to a local church family, because here you're going to find support. We looked at this last week, and I encourage you to be a part of the church. Well, there's one last thing. And man, this one gets me every time I think about it. But if you're going to run your marathon to mature, the sixth thing you need to remember the Bible teaches about this race of life is you just realize that what I don't finish, God will. What I don't complete, because I got a lot of dreams, a lot of plans, and I don't know if God will ever allow me to finish some of the things and dreams he's placed in my heart. But whatever I don't finish, God's going to finish. I, I love that. What I don't get finished in my life, God will. I was created to become like Jesus Christ. I'm never going to completely become like Jesus until he comes for me and takes me to heaven and eliminates sin. But if I don't get there and there's some remaining parts left, God's going to complete the character development in my life and in your life one day. He's going to finish it. He's going to bring us to perfection, completion, he says in heaven. Man, think about this in Philippians chapter 1. This is what Paul says. He's thinking about in that prison cell he's in as he writes this. Great promise. Paul says, I'm sure that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work. Remember, it's not my work. It's not your work. It's his work. Until it is finally finished on that day when Christ Jesus comes back again. Friends, what a day. That's going to be. <laughs> what a day. When you either go into heaven or, you know, you know, he could come for us in the rapture. But either one, it's a win. What a day it's going to be. Because on that day, when you see Jesus face to face, you're going to be transformed. The scripture says that's when the race is complete. That's when we are mature in him, when we are transformed to become like him. All your weakness, gone. All your limps, gone. All your fears and faults, gone. All your failures and frailties, gone. All your insecurities, gone. All your blemishes and flaws, gone. And you will be transformed into perfection one day. And you will reflect the glory of God. Man. You know, the older I get, the more exciting that seems to me. That's such good news. I'm not who I ought to be today. <laughs> you know, you're not who you ought to be. We're a fraction of what we could be. But God says, it's okay. I'm taking my time. I'm cheering you on at every stage. You just take every, every step with purpose. Because one day, I'm going to finish what you didn't finish. And you're going to be changed instantly into my likeness if you put yourself into my care and my hands. Oh, what a day that's going to be. What I don't finish in my lifetime, what you don't finish in your lifetime, God is going to finish. You know, uh, in this race of life, you may have struggled in your race. And yeah, welcome to the human race, right? In this race, you may have stumbled. We've all been there. In this race, you may have been sidelined. We've been there. 
But your race is not over. It's not. Your heart's still beating. Your race is still going. And it's never too late to get back up and get in the race again. It's awesome. It's wonderful. And I want to encourage you to run with us in this family called Highlands. Man, let's all run together to do great things for God. He wants to do great things in and through us. And what we don't finish, he's going to finish. As your pastor, man, I'm committed to help you cross the finish line. So get in the race and let's run together. Hey, would you pray with me? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that you have called us to this marathon of maturity. And God, we may have to simplify some things to get rid of some baggage, to maybe change some relationships we're involved in or let go of a friendship that's just dragging us down. <laughs> Lord, help us not to get impatient. I'm impatient. I, I get impatient so much. And, and Lord, just remind me how long it takes you to form and build an oak tree. You're making oak trees in us, not little tomato vines. <laughs> God, you're, you're, you're perfecting us. And Lord, uh, I know that sometimes we struggle in this race and sometimes we get really discouraged, but God put a team around us to run with. We need each other. We need support when we get down. We need, we need help because there are days that life throws things at us. We just want to give up. And God, remind us there is a reward waiting when we see you. And what we don't finish, God, you will. There is a day coming where we will become like Jesus. Wow. God, I'm so far from that today, and yet I've been in this race for a long, long time. But I'm learning every day, trying to spend a little time with you every day. And God, you bring up things to me every day that I need to deal with and reckon with and get out of my life and ask for forgiveness because I'm so imperfect. But God, we serve a perfect God who loves us and is cheering us on every day. And so, Lord, help us just to understand that our third purpose that we were created is to become like Jesus. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus, why well, you're just missing out on life. And I would encourage you, what, what in the world are you waiting on? You, you, you really think you're going to find peace in this world? It's crazy. You need Jesus. He loves you. He wants you to receive his love. And all you have to do to do that is just open up your heart. Just invite him in and say, Lord, I know you sent Jesus to die on the cross for me and he paid my sin debt. And today I receive him as Lord and Savior of my life. And God, I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me. and Help me now to demonstrate that you have saved me by going public in baptism, joining a local church and getting on this marathon of maturity to race every day until you call me home. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in my life. Lord, thank you for loving us. And thank you for challenging us every day to become like you. Have your will and way in Jesus' name. Amen.